it's the off season now. It's the time where you have to think and you reflect, but more importantly, you think about the future. And when it comes to the future, you think about the NFL draft and free agency. And for that, I have brought in from 98.5 in Boston, uh, covers the Patriots, uh, Mr. Alex Barth. Alex, how are we doing today? Doing good. Thanks for having me, Griff. No problem. No problem. Um, before we get into any real Patriots talk, I wanted to ask you, because I saw you posted a photo the other day, but does the lighthouse and all the construction look as good in person as it does over photos? Or Well, it, it looks like a framework right now, but it's going to look pretty cool. Uh, that thing, it, pictures don't do justice, just how massive it is. Like, it really is striking. So I'm excited to see what it looks like once they get the paneling on there, because I think it's going to be very impressive. Nice, nice, nice. Because I was down there in October, and it was just at the point where the lighthouse hadn't even started being built yet. But then the um, what I think that hospitality area, whatever is going to be inside there, that was yeah. coming more or less going into fruition. So it'll be it'll be cool to see once it's all done, which I think it should be July, but I wouldn't be shocked if it went into August. Yeah, I, I, it's, um, I think they said it's supposed to be done by the regular season, but there's also like once they get the exterior part done for the season, that's really all that matters, right? We can see it. The inside, they can take their time. Exactly, exactly. It's all about yeah. like how it looks on the outside, not how it looks on the inside for, right. for the public eye. Um, shifting gears quickly, to, not gear, but, but quickly, but shifting gears now back to what we we're going to talk about. I wanted to talk on the draft more or less just because I wanted to get where you are, not only as someone who covers the team, but also do you, like if you're not sure of how much of a fan, like a fan experience you still have with the fact you recover the team and everything. But with pick 14, how do you look at it from a position standpoint? Do you think offensive line do you think defensive back or are you thinking like somewhere outside of the box that maybe you know what the average person or the average Patriots fan isn't exactly looking at I think it's those two really I think it should be tackle 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 and this is such a great tackle class uh they can't afford to miss it they need two so even if they are to sign a guy in free agency like they need on the left and right side they're going to get a player who might not normally be there on 14. They at 14, they could get a guy who's a true top 10 talent a little later on just because there's so much depth at the position in this class. Now, the one argument I kind of allow room for is if they want to take one of these corners, I'm a big fan of this cornerback class as well. But at the same time, I think as good as the tackle class is, I think it's more top heavy. I think the cornerback class a little deeper. I think you can still get a maybe first round talent corner at the 46th pick the way this board's going to fall. So if you tell me they're going to take Joey Porter Jr. 14, I'm not going to be upset, but I really want to see it be a tackle. The one other position I think they even consider is maybe wide receiver, whether it's Jordan Addison or Zay Flowers. Those would probably be the two guys I think that they should seriously consider in that spot. But it's kind of the same thing as corner. I think there's going to be better receivers further down. I look at a guy like Kayshawn Booty from LSU, who's probably going to, maybe not at 46, but they could do like what they did when they drafted Christian Barmore and trade up uh, into, you know, up back to the, towards the top of the second round. So to me, it's tackle, tackle, tackle. I, I really have no interest in seeing them go any other way. Yeah, I, I was always on the train of, and by the way, you're not the first Patriot supporter that I've spoken to that's been high on Zay Flowers. And they've, yeah got me on Zay Flowers too. But when it comes to tackles, you're right. Like I look at all these guys and I think because of what other positions are and also because I think there's going to be a lot of goofiness that happens because it's draft night. I think there's going to be some quarterbacks that might maybe get reached on, which we can get into a little bit. But I still feel like if a guy like, let's say, Paris Johnson or Peter Skoransky, uh, Skoransky, my bad, are there at 14, it's a little hard to pass up. Like you said, if they go, say if Christian Gonzalez is still there, Joey Porter Jr. is still there, it's understandable, but at the same time, too, I feel like tackle could be a real swing and a miss pick where I agree with you where, you know what, for at 46 or even maybe at the Carolina pick, you can still find someone that can come and help in this team year one. Yeah, absolutely. Position. Yeah, corner and wide receiver. I think it's interesting how this draft lines up with their needs, right? Their biggest needs are tackle, corner, and wide receiver. Those are probably the three strongest positions in this draft. Uh Tight end is up there as well in terms of their needs. I really like this tight end class. I'm not as high on the top end of it, but I love the depth. Um, uh, even defensive tackle, honestly, is another spot that I like for them on day three. And I think there's a really good group of day three defensive tackles. So they can kind of just paint. Now, who knows if they'll actually do this given their history, but yeah. <laughs> I think they can kind of just sort of paint by number in this draft and walk away with a pretty good class. Uh, them actually doing that's another story again, but they don't have to get super creative to, to add the kind of players they need to add. Like it was, I, 
it was last year, right, where they were in the, they were at that twenty first pick, and it kind of felt like a void where the players that it felt like were going to impact them the most were either going earlier or later. There wasn't really anybody in that range that was going to be one of their guys, and they could reach, but they could also move back. And when they did move back, look, I thought you know a guy like Dax Hill who went to Cincinnati, or or a guy like um, Quay Walker who was available. Like if they make that move, that makes a ton of sense, but they kind of had to move around the board to make some of that stuff happen. They really, there's not a ton of reason to do that this year. Maybe they want to add a fifth round pick if they want to add a specialist, but yeah, I, I, I really like the board for them this year. So basically the logic behind it would be more or less don't overthink it. Just kind of like go with your gut and go with the player that you think is going to help best impact this team on day one. Yeah, a, a chalk draft for them is very good. Like, yeah. this is a little bit extreme. I did as a joke, I I did a mock draft where it was just all the guys named Jones in this draft class. <laughs> and it's actually like a decent draft if they actually did that, which kind of proves like where the strengths are in this class, it's so easy for them to just kind of hit on them if they don't try to get too out of the box with it. Where it can be basically the tagline could be the 2023 New England Patriots keeping up with the Joneses. That can, like, you can literally yeah. build it around there. <laughs> Um, and then with actually, we'll go, I want to go into that right now. So I don't know if you saw that report that came out, apparently this Zap Bailey kid who I've never heard of before. Yeah. seems, seems yeah. like a quarterback. I mean, I got to see Bailey Zappy. That's thing I was saying. I should told you off air. The one game I went to this year was the lions game. Yeah. So I got to see him there, but when they, when that report comes out about, look, I understand that Bill was maybe not happy with Max attitude in certain times when he was getting a little frustrated and stuff like that. But at the same time, too, I don't think that they brought in Zappy to overtake Jones. I think Zappy was always brought in to basically, look, we knew Jared Stidham wasn't it, and Zappy's there to be a capable backup when his number is called upon. Yeah, I what I make of all that, like, I don't think there's a great chance Mac Jones gets traded, mainly yeah, no. because I don't think they, like, Robert Kraft's been out here defending Mac Jones tooth and nail, right, over the last month. Yeah. I don't think they let Robert Kraft do that. If there's a chance they're going to trade him. I think somebody tells him, Hey, just like be careful what you say about Matt. Cause you're putting the owner in a really bad spot at that point. I, also, everybody's saying like, people are talking about, Oh, well they see Mac Jones and Bailey Zappi as similar. People are talking about that as some sort of knock on Mac Jones. It doesn't need to be. No, maybe they also think, you know, Bailey Zappi is a starting caliber player. So I think Mac has more upside. I think he processes things quicker. I think his release is quicker. I think he's a little bit bigger. But I like both quarterbacks. I, moving on from Mac Jones this early would be a mistake. Uh, but I, that doesn't mean that they can't like Bailey Zappi. Yeah, that's because that's the thing, though. Like I said, Bailey, when Bailey got brought in in that Green Bay game, the Detroit game, the Cleveland game, he looked good. And then for everyone saying the Chicago game, like I think the Chicago game is something that you see from every team in every single sport. You have a night where nothing was clicking. That was just it was that was one of those games to where it caused this whole debate of everything like there. But the one thing I always like to point out, up until the Buffalo game, Max turnovers went down a lot compared to his, before the ankle sprain to after the Chicago game. Yeah, so a couple things on that. I'd say with Zappi, and look, I like I was talking about Bailey Zappi in October of 2021. I was oh. the first one on the Zappi train when he was at Western Kentucky slinging the rock. But the line, he didn't play like amazing against the Lions. He They, they scored defensive touchdown that game. They had some turnovers. Um, the Browns defense finished the season 31st in the league. Yeah. The Bears defense was a true test. That was a good defense. And I don't necessarily think he's that bad, like as he looked in that game, but I don't think you can totally throw that out either. I think that was a learning experience for him. Would he have bounced back from that if he got another start? Yeah, I think he would have. But the Lions game to me is a little bit fool's gold. As for Mac, the turnovers were down. They also drastically changed the offense. Uh, the offense before Max sprained his ankle was YOLO. It was drop back and just sling it 40 yards. And that's yep. a very high turnover offense. That's basically the Jameis Winston 30-30 offense. When he came back, they, they were petrified to throw the ball across the line of scrimmage. And I'm not just saying Mac. I mean, they there were plays that they were just hammering that screenplay, right? Like low-risk plays the trick is to find some middle ground between those two, because that's where Mac's going to be successful. I don't think he's truly as turnover prone as he was those first four weeks of the season. And I, or first three weeks and we saw it last year, but 
you, I don't think you can necessarily take the turnover numbers from the second half and be like, oh, he never turns it over. Like the, you can't really use anything from last year. It was just such a mess, right? So, um, I do think it's good he didn't turn the ball over down the stretch there, but it's going to be interesting to see kind of, all right, what of that is actually usable, and what of that was just the offense not making sense. It may have been fool's gold, but. God damn it. I loved it. That's all. I oh, it was, it was that. fun as hell. Don't get me wrong. That was a great time. I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm not going to knock that down at all. I also had to bring out the towel just because it was like the perfect moment for me. It was actually my first ever game. I got to attend a Gillette stadium. So I just take that with a piece of cake, but the when you, or I take that with what, as it is, yeah. but you're right though, in the sense where it was five field goals, it was six fourth down turnovers. That was Dan Campbell being too extreme. So tw- that's why 29, nothing happens. But I always look at that as a happy day, but you're right in the sense too. I, I even think the games like even the Colts game, like the Colts game was just the defense was all over Sam Ellinger that game. And that proved that, Hey, that's not Mac Jones. I think this year you get them under a system with Bill O'Brien and we'll see what happens. But even going back to your, um, the sling at 40 yards, high turnover yeah. prone offense. I think of one play during the season. And that was the week two game against Pittsburgh where he had that bomb to Nelson Aguilar. I always say, because if that ball is not a touchdown, I don't know if the Patriots win that game. So the fact that that was a touchdown, I think that went a long way to them winning a game. So I do agree with you on that. Um, Going to free agency now. So then if you want to address offensive line in the draft, and you said offensive line as well in free agency, is there any guys in particular you're looking at? Because I know there are some, but there's a lot of guys that are, um, and I can give who an offensive lineman I want after. But I look at a lot of the guys, and I think, just the price tag might be a little high or we don't know what we're getting. So when you look at an offensive lineman free agent for the Patriots, who do you think would be a good fit and both on the field and financially? Sure. Uh, I'm not too worried about the cost. They're projected to have either the third or third to fifth most cap space in the league. They can be competitive bidding. This is their biggest need. Mm -hmm. They're in position where they can hand out big contracts. And if you're going to hand out a big contract this off season, you're handing it out a tackle. Maybe if you trade for Jerry Judy, that would be the one other guy, but I, It sounds like Orlando Brown's going to get franchised by the Chiefs. Yeah. So you figure he's not available. So it's pretty much all right tackles. Mike McGlinchey's my favorite just because I I like his size. But if they end up with Juwan Taylor, that's a great addition. That's my top two. Caleb McGarry is like tier 1A. I he, he, He had kind of a career year last year. He was a little slower getting going. So I don't know. Or you're, you're paying more upside than production at that point. But if they walk away with any of those three, I'd be happy. I'd rather Taylor or McGlinchey, but again, McGarry's a, a good fit as well. And I'm not, you're going to have to pay top of the market and it's right tackle. It's not left tackle. So it's, yeah. you know, that's potentially a difference of seven or $8 million a year, but they can hand out a big contract this off season. They very much can. And there's no position. It makes more sense to do it at given where the roster sits, who's available. There's no position that it makes more sense to do it at than tackle. Yeah, I, I know like they're going to be probably top, like you said, top, like somewhere in that three, four, five and cap. I just yeah. look at it from a sense of do they want to push all their money into tackle? But at the same time, too, you know what? Sometimes you, you got to do what you got to do. Another name I look at potentially is Andre Dillard if they want to like go for the cheaper side, just because he kind of got pushed out of the starting lineup in Philly to where, look, he's going to want to be looking for a second chance somewhere. So I think, you know what, if you want to take a chance on him, great. Um, but I do like your uh, Mike McGlinchey take as well. That's a guy I have in mind. But I feel like every highlight pack, they oh, someone always looks at like that one bad play that he has in the game, but he's a guy that him and Cole strange. I don't know if it's just because of the bar down the middle, which there's a name for that bar when I was playing high school ball that I'm not going to mention on air, but look, a guy like Mike McGlinchey has that Notre Dame and Notre Dame build up just big meaty, beefy offensive lineman. So you know what, if they want to bring him in all fine by me, because when I look at this offensive line, I only look at right now, Andrew starting a strange, uh, I know Connor McDermott got re-signed. For everyone freaking out about that, look, he's a good depth piece to have. You want those right. depth pieces. But the biggest signing has us feeling really good because Matthew Slater's coming back for another season in the NFL. So we have to continue, let's like t- taper down on his Hall of Fame takes, which, look, I, I'm 100% on the train if he's going to be there one day, both red and gold. But how much do you think that dude does off the field more than on the field with Slater coming back for another season? Yeah, I I think it helps. I think we saw towards the end of last year that there was maybe a little bit of a disconnect between the coaching staff and the players, and he's a guy that's going to help mend that. So I think 
anytime you can get a strong voice in that locker room, in that locker room, that's important. I think, you know, on the field, he contributes as well. He, he had a great year last year. I don't think their special teams issues were due to him. So to me, and they get him for it's half of a percent of the salary cap that his yeah. contract takes up 0.6. I should be exact 0.6%. I'm yeah. I no complaints there. I, I think that if he was willing to come back, I'm surprised. I thought he was going to retire. He sounded after that bills game, like a guy that was ready to walk away, but I'm not going to complain. I just, I if he was willing to come back, I was always willing to take him back. Yeah. I think that's how every Patriot fan felt basically like, you know what? The door's always open. Um, and then the next one is we'll see what happens with Devin McCourty. But for the most part, this team is a team I think a lot of people are starting to write off. But I'll be honest with you, when I look at this Patriots team, I'd rather be in the position that we're in than, say, the New York Jets are in, where you have all your other pieces figured out, but the most important one on your football team. So we'll, we'll ultimately end up see wait and see what happens with this team. But if you're a Patriots fan, look, I even say this, 2020, 2020, Seven and nine shouldn't have happened. That should have been a four and 12 football team. And I say that with love. Like there's a couple games I look where I'm like, they had no business winning. Then 20 and two, two happens where it's like nine and eight, but nine and eight considering all the dysfunction. So for 2023, I'm not saying, look, they're going to be in Vegas next February. I'm just saying it's going to be, it's, I think they're going to be a team that they're, they are fun to watch, but there's still some moments where it can be frustrating. I don't know how you feel about that. That's just the way I got to get a vibe. Yeah. On it. No, I mean, I they if they make the moves they should make, and that's an if. And I wrote about this on 985thesportso.com. I did a whole 10 point plan at the beginning of the offseason. You can go find it on my Twitter at Real Alex Barth. It's my pinned tweet. Um, if they like were to follow that plan, I don't think competing for the divisions out of the question. That doesn't mean they're going to win it, no. but they're going to be in it down to the last week or two. Like they, if they, they can put themselves in that position. Cause I think Buffalo is going to slide back. Uh, we'll see what happens with the dolphins. I think the dolphins sort of are what they are. The jets are the one team that worries me a little bit. Cause I love that roster minus the quarterback position. If they get a real quarterback, not Derek Carr, like a real quarterback, I think they're cooking with gas, but I think the Patriots can be right there. I, I really think they can. Now they have to make the moves to do it. And so far I'm two for two on that checklist. Mm. Um, but We'll see ultimately what what they end up doing. But yeah, they can get to like a 10-11 win team, and that's going to put you right there for the division. Like you said, I don't know that they're going to be Super Bowl favorites. That's probably two, three years away. We got to see what happens with Mac after everything that happened last season. We've got to see if they can add that true pass catching threat. But they're not in a terrible place either. They're not in purgatory. Yeah. Or they don't need to be as long as they make the moves they should make. They don't need to be in purgatory. Like last year, my thing was always bet, worst case scenario was eight and nine. What happened? Best case was 10 and seven. I think this year that gets bumped up to somewhere between nine and eight to potentially even 11 and six. It's just that the cards fall right. Um, Cause when you were saying Buffalo is vulnerable, I think that fan base got to wake up to, Hey, you just don't tiptoe and walk straight to a Super Bowl Like they all thought like right away during the season. And then with Miami, it's all about health. I completely agree with you. They are basically put the Dennis green label. They are who we thought they were like right. where, They'll be a 10 and 7 team or 9 and 8 consistently. And then New York, like we said, I don't want them to get a quarterback, but also, too, I have a take about the Jets. I think, like, you know, this year everyone was on Miami because they had never beaten Josh Allen before, but then this yeah. year they got over that hump. I still think that if the Jets want to finally get a monkey off the back, they got to beat the Patriots because it's been seven That's years. True, yeah. And just what happened this year from the roughing the passer call to the Marcus Jones return. There's just something about if they go 0-2 against the Patriots again, I think it's just that – like I know our season went bad after we beat them, but at the same time, too, their only win was to the Nathan Peterman Bears, so you can't really compare the two. Right. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely something that they've got to um, – if the Jets get a quarterback, those games are going to be interesting next year. Yes, exactly. Um, with the draft, though, because I want to ask you this, because I've been seeing a lot of debate about this. If you're the Bears at number one – like how do you like how, what do you, what do you, what what are you thinking right now as like a draft just as a f- general football fan like do you because in my opinion I think you go Jalen Carter or if the Colts or the Carolina Panthers come knocking with a ungodly offer where you get like a San Francisco like a Miami Dolphins like three first round picks haul you take it I don't think you give up on Justin Fields I don't think so either I also just love this draft class if I'm yeah. them I ask for. First, second, first this year, first next year, second and third this year. 
move down to four or five and take Will Anderson or Jalen Carter. I think that's a win-win. I actually have Anderson ahead of Carter personally. They're close. Yeah. But let one of the quarterback teams move up to one. Double your top 100 picks in this class. Add a top 50 pick next year as well. And then get yourself a guy who's going to be a potential defensive player of the year candidate, like perennial defensive player of the year candidate. Um, that sounds like a win, win, win. And then they have another pick, I think in the first round, right. Or early in the second, you go get one of those receivers. You help beef him up. Like um, I'm taking all I can for that pick. I am getting all the draft capital. I can, you look at uh, you know what some of these other teams have done when they've gotten these draft halls. And it usually ends up better for the team getting the hall than getting the better individual picks. So if I'm the bears, that's what I'm doing. I'm not moving in another year, maybe because Justin Fields, it wasn't this coach. It wasn't this GM that picked him. Yeah. If it's next year and there's a guy like Caleb Williams on the board, I might view it differently. But in this class, I, I would move that pick, stay in the top five, get an edge rusher, get a bunch of picks. Yeah, because their defense, it, it, that's the only thing that still works for me is the fact that they literally sold their defense after beating us with Robert Quinn going to the Eagles, that Smith going to the Ravens, but that's neither here nor there. Um, another Patriots question quickly. We talked about the Jerry Judy trade earlier. You mentioned it. Yeah. Is he your ideal trade candidate if you go, or do you kind of like look at a guy like, say, Hopkins, or even – I still look at the T. Higgins thing, but I feel like that requires a lot, so I don't know if I want to put all my eggs in that basket, but – there's just a couple of those names where it's just like you could really, really help Mac out if you go get someone like that. Yeah, T. Higgins is just going to cost too much. Like I'd take him; he's a great player. But oh, 100. When you factor it all in, and in Bill O'Brien's offense, that slot role is so much more important than that boundary role. Do you know who? So when O'Brien was here in 2011, yes, they were a record-setting offense that year, one of the best offenses in NFL history. Do you remember who their X receivers were that year? Who their boundary receivers were that year? I remember Chad Johnson was here for a brief was one. Stint. Was one. Wes Walker. Well, he was in the slot. Like, who was the, was the slot? Like, the role that T. Higgins X. would be playing. See, all my see, uh, all my memories from that season are the Boston Tea Party, as I like to call them. Okay. Um, so, it was it was an over Was it 30, Underwood? No, it was an over 30 Dion Branch. Oh, that's... R- so, I the point being, oh. this offense can be lethal without a true X receiver, but... Yeah. It all runs through the slot. It all runs through the slot and specifically having a guy there that can create after the catch. And that's Jerry Judy to me. So T Higgins is a fantastic player and maybe O'Brien O'Brien probably does adjust to him if he has him. But when you look at what Mac Jones does well, when you look at what Bill O'Brien wants his offense to do, yep, it's Jerry Judy to me. And I don't think you need to give up a first round pick to get him. I don't. And so you can still add that tackle and now you're really cooking. So I, I Jerry Judy to me is the guy. I, I think so too, because like I, like at first I look at Nuke and everything like that because of the Bill Belichick video from the Cardinal game earlier this year. Like how people viewed the Hunter Henry photo after the Charger game when forty five nothing. So right. I, I completely agree with you on that. Where it's like you know what, go get Jerry Judy, go get a guy, excuse me, who needs that second chance. I even look at another guy like if the Colts want to burn it down, go get Michael Pittman Jr. for example. But I think that would cost more. Um, I completely forgot about that in 2011 because I remember so many vivid memories of the year from like the Dallas Cowboy game to yeah. my the biggest one still the Billy Cundiff miss where I was in complete shock that he missed. Of course, or yeah. me not. I remember that year I didn't buy into Tebow Mania. Knew the Patriots would whoop them, and what happened it happened twice, and then right. ultimately falling in the Super Bowl. So it is what it is. But this is a team to get excited for, and another X. So okay, so staying on receiver because I want to do this. Yeah. So. I think with Myers, like I love love to keep him, but if a team like Chicago or Atlanta throw fifteen million dollars or ten million dollars a year at him, you let him walk for as great as he's been. You, I think that happens, but I want to see them use Kendrick Bourne and a player I'm, I I really want to see get used more is Tyquan Thornton next year. I just think the collarbone injury really offset his whole rookie development, but I think this year if he can have a healthy off season and go into the season at one hundred percent, the kid's got Jets. Yeah, so I on on Jacoby. If yeah. it costs ten million to get him, he's going to be back here. There's Ooh. he, but like his market's going to be maybe double that. Yeah, I think because you look at that Christian Kirk contract last year. If I'm oh. him, that's where I'm starting. Oh, that's eighteen. That's so right. I think he's going to be somewhere in that seventeen to twenty million dollar range. And yeah. at that point, yes, I let somebody else pay him that contract. I think he's a really good player, but he plays the slot a certain style. They need more after the catch ability from that spot. 
Yeah. And that's just not his game. So let somebody else pay him and use that money elsewhere, whether it be on a tackle, whether it be maybe to pay a guy like Jerry Judy, if you bring him in, maybe you invest that money at corner at safety. Um, I think that it's in the best interest of both sides. Yeah. If Jacoby Myers ends up elsewhere, I Kendrick Bourne, 100% should play more. Yep. I, I think he's their best receiver right now. Now, if they acquire somebody else, maybe not, but, uh, and as for Taekwon, it's going to be interesting to see how Bill O'Brien uses him because as we talked about, there's not a ton for that X to do in this offense, but where Mac had a lot of success in college and something Bill O'Brien had a lot of success with at Alabama was the concept of that speed slot where you put him in line, you get him on a slot corner who's maybe doesn't have the same straight line speed and you run him up the field on goes and posts and you can create that way and you or off the RPO off slants. So I'm very interested to see how they're going to use Tyquan Thornton this year. I don't necessarily think it's going to be a high volume role, but I think he can still be very impactful if they use him the right way. Exactly. And I also say all this stuff about spending and money, by the way, just because like there's that fan of me that doesn't want to go, they're going to go out there and just like throw money at everyone again. That's like what happened two years ago is not, is not what's going to happen again. And also because there's two players on the defensive side of the ball and Duggar and Judon. Do you look at extending them like guys like that now, or even giving Josh Uche another contract now, or do you push those to next February, like this time next year? So Duggar, I think would make a lot of sense for an extension. I don't know if he'd do it. Uh, safety, the, the, the price, the inflation at safety is more extreme than any other position. Safeties are starting to inch into that premium uh, position. $20 million. <laughs> right. So, and he's going to, he's going to set that market. Yeah. If he, if he hits the open market, I would love to see them get an extension done with him. I think he's proven it. Um, I, I don't know exactly what that would look like, but he's a guy to me. That's definitely candidate for an extension. I would hope they at least talk to him about it. Judon still has two years left, I believe. Uh, he's under contract through 2024. Oh, that's a four-year four deal. It's that's a four-year right. deal. So I, you can maybe start talking to him about it. I don't think there's a ton of need to do that right now. I think you let him play out next year and you see where you're at. Josh Uche is an interesting one. It kind of depends mm -hmm. how they want to approach it, how he wants to approach it. He has like half of a good season in three years, right? He was excellent, but yes. it's half a year. So do the Patriots see it as, you know, hey – we're going to pay you for your full body of work and you maybe get this elite pass rusher under cost. But is he going to say, man, I can build on what I did at the back half of last year. And now I'm going to hit the open market as an elite pass rusher. Right. So that's kind of a weird one. Yeah. Or, or right. Or does Uche say, you know what? I had a really good half year last year and I'm going to get some financial security for the next three or four years. Just banking on that. Does he jump at that opportunity, even if he's maybe leaving money on the table? And he'd maybe leave a lot of money on the table. Like what Jelani Tavai did back in, I think it was December that he signed that extension. Yeah, so that's what it comes down to. Well, it, it, we're talking about, I think, a lot more money here with Uche. Oh, but more money, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you're right, you're getting yourself that financial security for the short-term right. work instead of thinking, hey, what I can do long-term. Yeah, so it's going to be interesting to see how his situation plays out. My guess is just seeing how pass rushers can make so much money, right? I would yeah. think he's going to want to bet on himself and hit the market. But it, it, oh, Duggar's, Doug, Duggar's value is, it's not getting any higher. Like, yeah. in, like he has, he'd have to win defensive player of the year this year, basically, for his value to get any higher. He can command, he can ask for what he's going to command. He can ask for a top of the market contract. And I wouldn't, if the Patriots want to give it to him right now, you get ahead of that thing a year, that'd be great. The one other guy I'd bring up too, is Mike Onwenu is the other guy who's yes. eligible for an extension right now. And I'd rather see them extend Duggar than him just because I think uh, Gar, he's going to be easier to bring back as a free agent. I also just trust them more to find a guard. It's a position they've been very good at. But I wouldn't hate them getting an extension done with, with Michael Onwenu either. I think that's another guy they should talk to this offseason. I think Michael Owenu can be that kind of guy where he kind of takes that Patriot discount in the sense, like the take the financial security over what you could do, because I don't think we're going to see Michael Owenu become like, he's a good guard, but I don't think we're going to see him at, uh, I'm just playing on who, like a Zach Martin, for example. I don't think we're okay, going to yeah. see him reach like, the, I, like I love Michael Owenu. Don't get me wrong, but you know what I mean? I don't like, I don't know if he'll be like in that first team, all pro category. I think he's very soft, very, very, a very, very solid uh, guard when it comes to that. But even like you said, if he decides to walk after the season, you can easily find another guard or you can even like, look, it's a position that right. you have security and the Patriots going out and finding. And then with running back, 
do you bring back Damian Harris or are you on like, cause I'm on the train of, I think you let him go somewhere else. And I think you run a backfield of Stevenson, but then strong and Harris get elevated roles. So I normally, I don't pay that early down back roll. I'm generally pretty against that. I think Damian Harris, though is a very important voice in that locker room. I think a lot of guys listen to him. I think a lot of guys look up to him. Mac and him are I'm also not, buddies. <laughs> right. I'm not breaking the bank to keep him, but if he, there's some incentive for him too to come back to you know after an injury season to come back to a place where he knows he can seed for succeed, come back here for one year and reset his value. If he wants to take like a team friendly incentive heavy deal, come back here and and spell Ramondre. I'm all for it. Like I'm not totally writing off him come back, but if other teams are going to pay him competitively and kind of say, yeah, we know about the injuries, but we we've seen what he's done when he's healthy. At that point, I'm probably out. I, I will say they can't run Ramondre into the ground like he did. They did last year. Just his usage was way too high. I get that he's a great player, but you saw it wear on him at the end of the year, and you saw how it impacted the team. They need another early down back. Maybe that is Kevin Harris. Maybe it, I don't think it's JJ Taylor, but like he'll be in no. the running. I wouldn't hate seeing them add another running back in the draft, like late or even as a UDFA. You know, got like Tavion Thomas from Utah is a guy I look at. And I say, if they're going to let Damian Harris walk, plug Tavion Thomas into that role. But I, for the leadership he brings, and I, he's just, when he talks, people listen. I love listening to him talk. He's a very passionate guy, uh, wears his heart on his sleeve. Like, he, I want him on my team. I want to find a way to put that guy on my team, but they don't need to get in bidding war for him, right? Uh, but yeah. I'm not like, I'm not writing him off either. I'm only right. I'm not writing him off. I just think he's one of those guys that like, if he went and got a change of scenery, like say if I don't know, Las Vegas threw money at him just because I feel like that's a very right. predictable thing to have happened. But at the same time too, the more you got me, you got me thinking by what you're saying, I could see him doing like what we saw McCordy do years ago. What we saw Hightower do. What we seen Patrick Chung do Hell, what David Andrews did two years yeah. ago. You go out there, you see your options. And then, you know, Belichick comes to you and says like, Hey, We'll give you a two-year deal. Say it's like five million a year, something like in that small range where you can kind of bet on yourself with them out of the five, like only seven and a half guaranteed, for example, or even six is guaranteed. And then from there, you can kind of hey prove yourself again, work yourself back from injury, and then maybe next off season or even in two years from there, then you can go and chase your bag. I only say Vegas too, just because we don't know what's going to happen with Josh Jacobs as well, but. Right. It, it's it's a very intriguing offseason. It's a very, you know what, you got me thinking, you got me more excited just because look, we have I don't know if are you will you be at the combine in Indianapolis next week or uh I will not be. I will be covering it from home, but I'll be watching. I'll I'll be keeping an eye on it. I, I wasn't sure if you'll be there at same St. Elmo's uh, steakhouse, I believe it's called. I wish, then, I wish. Once we'll, some eventually. Eventually, eventually. We'll yeah. we'll, we'll we'll definitely look out for that. Um, I have, obviously you plugged it earlier, but before you go, if people want to find your work, if people want to listen to you, the floor is yours, Alex. Yeah. Uh, at real Alex Barth on Twitter, you can find all my written work on 98, five, the com. I also host the catch 22, the Patriots catch 22 podcast with Evan Lazar on Patriots.com and Patriots YouTube channel. You can find that every Thursday. And then I also host Patriots beat with Mike Cadlick on CLNS media, you can find that. Honestly, we make a schedule as we go, but we do that twice a week on the CLNS Media YouTube channel. Yes, yeah, so it's like it's never really. It's like that's like what I do. It's like it's never really a set date that you record. It's just like you kind of find a date where it's like, hey, works for you, works for me. Okay, let's go. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So we we were able to do it today. That's why I was late, and I apologize again for that. But um, we try to do Tuesday, Thursday. That's generally what we want to do. But especially in the off season, where you know, because I cover the other, I cover the Celtics too sometimes, oh. and in the Bruins, so. And Mike's got another job. So we, you know, you got to work around those schedules in the off season, but try to do Tuesday, Thursday, but there's actually a new one up right now. Oh, well, everyone, you have to go check that out. Um, before we go quickly, there is a running backs name who popped into my head that the Patriots okay. could draft after uh, in the later rounds. And I'm blanking on his first name, but it's the Muhammad kid from Minnesota. Oh, Mo Ibrahim. Yeah. Mo Ibrahim. My yeah. bad. Mo Ibrahim. I got to talk to him at the shrine bowl. Uh, I was very impressed. He was a, like a true downhill runner at Minnesota had a ton of production and they love that at the running back position, but he was really just a between the tackles guy, like workhorse power back. And then I talked to him before the week of practices started. And he said, he wanted to show teams that he was a well-rounded back and that he could catch passes. And I'll be honest. I was a little like, 
that's what you're going to showcase. Not your like downhill ability. You caught, he caught six passes his last year in college and he looked really natural as a receiver. I was really impressed with how natural he looked catching the football. So he's supposed to kind of be like a sixth, seventh round guy. Yeah. That would be, I think a guy like that in that range, that skill set would totally be in the sweet spot for them with the running back. That's a great pull. It's um, it was Kyrie Thompson for W E E I that got that in my head. So uh, okay. I know it's, Budding rivalry radio stations, but he got that. And now there's some players you got me on. There's some players other people have got me on. It's just an exciting time to be a football fan because even though the games have stopped, the train keeps on moving. Yeah. Oh, I, I love the off season. Off seasons like draft. That's that's my thing. There's three seasons. There's football season. There's draft season. There's the summer, and that's pretty much it. That's a good way to look at it too. And then draft. And then as draft day approaches, I always watch. I know the people rag on the Kevin Costner movie draft day, but there's just something about it that just kind of gets the juices flowing as you get closer to the draft. And if there's that weekend in April where it's just, you know, for three days, you just watch these kids get their dreams come true. And then I don't know what network you watch it on, but then you just see them get showcased and everything like that. It's just, it's yeah. great. Yeah. It's great. But anyway, folks, that's going to do it here for episode number 217 of YWC football talk. As always, we are on crier media. You can find us anywhere, any podcast platform and on YouTube. But anyway, guys for Alex, I'm Griff. Have a good night, everybody and go Patriots.